here just the little ones um, they're using water currently from oxbow springs which is just behind there it's up in the hills by that little house and we're gonna walk up there and see the springs they're in boxes there well two of them are in boxes one of them is just flowing out of the hillside there's three springs so oxbow springs the water just comes down you'll be able to see it there's a little earthen dam back by those alder trees behind the hatchery the water all comes down into a pond there and then it comes into the hatchery and then the water flows from the hatchery out into Little Herman Creek which is this is all Little Herman Creek and it flows into Herman Creek which goes down into the Columbia really close by we'll pass it we'll go over Herman Creek on our way to the hike um, so the deal is that the state is working on a, a set of exchange permits and this gets a little confusing but basically Currently, this water is for the hatchery to use. It's public water. The public owns the hatchery system. The hatchery is using it. It's all within our public domain. The Oregon uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife is the one running the hatchery using the water, public water. Cascade Locks has their own water. They have some wells, some other systems set up. Nestle has come in and said, we want to build a bottling facility in Cascade Locks. And we really want to use the spring water because we can actually sell the spring water for more than we can sell your municipal water. So they want to do a swap where the spring water goes to Cascade Locks and suddenly it's municipal water for Cascade Locks. Then Cascade Locks can sell that water to Nestle. And in exchange, Cascade Locks is going to give some of their well water to this hatchery to run. One of the perks for the hatchery is there's less runoff from the springs in the summer. And so they're saying they'll have a better water supply in the summer for them um, to use. There's a couple issues with that. One is this water is cold. It's coming straight out of the ground. You'll see it. It's cold coming off Mount Hood from the glaciers, from the meltwater. The salmon and the steelhead really need that cold, cold water. The Columbia has been dammed many, many times. It's all just a series of reservoirs. All that water heats up and gets warm 
It encourages diseases, parasites, all kinds of problems. It doesn't flush out the young salmon out to the river. They have to swim because it's reservoirs. So they have a lot of stress, not to mention going through the dam system, like through the fish ladders, through the turbines, all of that. There's a lot of stress on them. One of the things that they have that's helping them is called a thermal refuge. And within the Columbia River, each little creek that comes down creates cold, a cold water pocket for them. So it's almost like a little ladder of thermal refuges that they can go up and down the Columbia on. And exchanging this water, one of the things that's going to happen is the well water, especially in the summer, is much warmer than the spring water. And when they swap it out, they're going to be running that well water into the stream after it comes out of the hatchery, just like they do now with the spring water, except it's a different temperature. So that thermal refuge is going to be decreased. These are threatened, endangered species that are using these refuges. So it's going to impact them. Um, this, the Nestle plant is proposed for Cascade Locks down by the river in an industrial area. It's going to be 225 square feet. They want to invest $50 million in it. They're saying that there will be... 225,000. What did I say? 225. <laughs> oh, 225,000, sorry, square feet. So a big facility. They're saying there will be about 50 jobs. About 40 plus of those will be available to locals. Um, Nestle has a history in other communities where they've built their plants of overselling the jobs that are actually going to be available and of saying, well, locals can get these jobs, but then they need really special skills that, you know, a bottling plant skills. And so people are probably going to be coming in for some of these jobs for these special skills. So um, Bark has decided this is not a good use for this water. This is our public water. Nestle wants to buy it for um, a, a fifth of a cent a gallon and then bottle it and sell it back to us for, you know, whatever. How much is it a gallon? Three dollars a gallon. A $3 truck... a pint. No, a, a dollar, dollar a pint. A dollar a pint, yeah. The, um, a truckload of this Nestle bottled water, it cost them ten dollars to buy the amount of water that is in a whole truckload of bottled water. They then sell that water for $50,000 for a truckload. So you can see the markup is enormous. And we have great tap water here. You know, it's coming off Mount Hood, we have Bull Run, we have amazing tap water. We don't need this bottled water. Um, if you think about it, it's a luxury product. It's really, you're buying convenience. Some people think they're buying status. It's a luxury product. No one needs bottled water in this area. We all have great water, access to great water, that is public, that we're paying for already. And the people who are buying that luxury product, they think, oh, well, you know, it's just $2, whatever, it's no big deal, it's fine. What they don't realize is they're paying for it in their taxes also. They're paying for the wastewater treatment. A Nestle plant, for every gallon of water that they bottle, it it takes three gallons of water to make that one gallon because they have so much wastewater that they use in their plant as they're bottling it. They're paying for it in the wastewater treatment. They're paying for it with the 200 trucks a day that are going to be running up and down I-84. We're going to have to maintain those roads, upgrade things in Cascade Locks to handle all that truck traffic. We're paying for that. Um, we're paying for it with it costs, it's 2,000 times more energy to have a pint of bottled water than a pint of tap water. 2,000 times more energy with the oil that goes into the plastic, with the transporting of the bottles, the transporting of the bottles after they have water in it, with the running of the plant, with the energy to make the bottles, with the energy to deal with the wastewater, with the energy to deal with the waste of the bottles when they're done. It's an enormous amount of energy. Um, so those people are paying more than they realize with their taxes. Not only that, we are all paying for it also. Even the people who don't buy the bottled water, I'm paying for it. I'm paying to upgrade these roads. I'm paying to maintain these roads for 200 more trucks. And it costs, by the way, $2 million per one lane for one mile to build a road. And that's to build a road. Maintaining is less, but still you can imagine a whole lot of public money is going into maintaining our roads. And um, so we're paying for that. I'm paying for that out of my taxes, whether I buy a of water or not, I'm paying for that. The waste stream, they want you to say, well, they're recyclable. They're recycled. Well, some are recycled, yes. In 2006, 
there were 40 million, no, I'm sorry, 40 billion plastic water bottles that went into the waste stream in 2006, one year. 85% of those went into the landfills. So a lot of it's going from the landfills. Yes, it's recyclable. Recycling also takes energy too. So not only am I paying for that if I don't buy bottled water, all of the wild creatures out here are also paying for that. They're paying for it with their habitat. They're paying for it with their lives. The salmon are gonna lose this thermal refuge. The um, glaciers are melting from global warming. This is all, all this energy use is contributing to global warming. The glaciers are a part of our energy, of our water security. As we lose those, we're just gonna be dependent on this year's snow melt. These springs are gonna change. They're not gonna be coming in the same way they've always been coming because they're coming off of those glaciers. They're coming off of that snow melt. So everyone is paying for this. It's not about the $2 that you pay in the convenience store for that bottle of water because you don't feel like bringing your own bottle and filling it up in the tap before you go. Everybody's paying for this. So it's a public issue. And yes, there may be some jobs involved. It's questionable how many, how many are gonna be actually for this economy. And I don't think it's worth it personally. So we brought you out here to show you the springs, show you what they're like now, show you what's going on, and you can decide for yourself whether you think it's worth it. One, two. How far are they shipping this bottle of water? Okay. Um, so what they say is that currently the bottle of water that's consumed in Oregon and Washington is produced in California and they're shipping it up here. And they want to produce that bottle of water closer to where it's consumed. Uh. So oh. what that means, obviously, it's if they succeed, that there's water coming from their plant in California right now and that is this is going to stop. That means obviously they're gonna lay off 40 or 50 people somewhere in California that they promised jobs to last year. And they're gonna do it to Cascade Locks, you know, next year because that's how they operate. They're, they're, uh, they're looking for every little niche to squeeze a little bit of cost cutting. And when the economics change slightly, when the price of fuel changes slightly, when demand for bottled water changes slightly, those jobs are gonna be gone. What is required of Nestle in terms of taxes and, and their coverage of the costs that you're talking about, infrastructure costs and... Uh, my understanding is, so right now the water is owned by the state of Oregon and they're making a deal to transfer ownership to the city of Cascade Locks. So it's a government to government deal. And then it's gonna be up to Cascade Locks to try to get the best deal they can out of it. Um, the state of Oregon really gets nothing out of this. That's all of us, the state of Oregon. We own this water currently. Um, we really get nothing out of this swap. Because this fish hatchery was built here in the first place because these springs are perfect for a fish hatchery. This, this is like a, an add-on to the operations down in Eagle Creek and it's pretty far away, but they put it here because the water is good and that's what the fish hatchery needs. Um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife in the state of Oregon is really getting nothing out of this. Uh, maybe some local property taxes will go to Nestle, uh, to Cascade Locks from Nestle. I'm not sure that's for the municipality to work out. But uh, I can tell you that a municipality of 1,100 people doesn't have much bargaining power with a, a company that's the largest food and beverage company in the world. The groundwater in Cascade Locks is hydrologically connected to the Columbia River. So there's sort of water coming in. It shares water with the Columbia River, just underground. So. I, I don't know, but I imagine it's about the same as the river. This water here is recent, well, I don't know how recent it is, it's snow melt that went into the ground somewhere up in the wilderness and hit an impermeable layer of rock and flowed down underground and it just pops out of the hillside. I think you'll understand what I mean by that when you see it. It's just kind of like there's a hillside and it just kind of pops out. 
because um, nobody's actually studied it. That's one of the things is as we're bringing this up. This is a, an issue. Somebody needs to study this, and nobody's given it any attention yet. So uh -huh. that they haven't considered it as a part of this proposal, as a part of the cost of this proposal. And the agreement between the ODF and W, the state agency that runs the hatchery, and the city of Cascade Locks to explore the potential trade does have some language in it that says that it's up to the state to see whether the quality of the water would meet the needs for the hatchery, just as it would be up to the city's potential buyer to determine whether the spring water would meet its quality needs to be FDA approved spring water. So there is some language in the agreement to allow for evaluation of this kind of information. The agency, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, doesn't have to make this trade. Uh -huh. And so Governor Kitzhauer has the authority to basically talk to and direct to the agencies as to what actions they're going to take and whether to move forward with this deal. And so that's why BARC and many other groups have been, and part of the coalition, have been asking for support for people to go and write letters and talk to the governor about the impacts that this is going to have and that the people of Oregon don't want this trade or if you do or you don't want this trade. Several permits that need to go through before this is would be a done deal. I mean, it's never a done deal all the way, right? Um, in McLeod, California, it was a done deal, but the public was, you know, applied a lot of pressure and actually Nestle chose to pack up and, and leave. But um, locally, what happened was the, uh, the fishery was withdrawing water from an incorrect source. And so what the fishery um, had on record as where they were um, sourcing their water was actually incorrect. So they just kind of had to do this um, transfer, uh, and I don't remember the exact language, I think a point of diversion swap to basically just uh, clean up their language and make sure they're actually talking about the right spring and source of water um, that would actually be transferred to Cascade Locks. Um, so we've been referring to them as housekeeping measures. So those are the two permits that have gone through. They're not the actual transfer of water from the state of Oregon, from um, ownership of us and the public to Cascade Locks. That has not occurred yet, and that can't occur um, until, uh, and maybe Courtney could speak more about um, where we're at with the, the legal challenge, but they can't move forward because um, we are challenging them um, in the courts. Folks are interested in learning more about how Nestle treats their communities and about the bottled water industry in general. It's a really great documentary called Tapped, and it talks about just the atrocities of bottled water and plastic and how it destroys communities. The, the processing plants are so disgusting as far as what they put off and then how bad plastic is for you. And then specifically, they go to a lot of communities where Nestle has had bottled watering plants and how they just destroyed them, upped the amount of water they were allowed to take um, from springs and made it so that basically the town couldn't get water, but Nestle was taking all the water. So. It's a really good, informative movie if you uh, are interested in learning specifically about Nestle and the bottled water industry, Tapped. And actually, Bark is doing a screening of Tapped um, on June 7th in Portland. Yeah, in the Mission Theater. There is a disease of wicked proportion Love of money and gold It's cure will never be had This is what I've been told This is what I've been Springs, 
This is the one of three. There's two more down that way, but this is the one that's the largest and most developed. And you can see there's just crystal clear water pouring out of it constantly. There's a question of like, why does Nestle want this water? Out of all the water that's in Oregon or anywhere, why this water? And the answer is it's the best water, it's the cleanest. And the reason it's the cleanest is because if you go uphill from here, you find nothing but wilderness. There's, there's this, uh, it's the Marco Hatfield Wilderness, I think, and the, the entire watershed that, served, that, that, uh, that flows into this little creek that comes out of here is perfectly pristine. There's been no logging, there's no cattle, nothing. And that's why this water is so clean, and that's why Nestle wants it. Now, the irony in that is that almost all of the water in the United States is polluted by cows. And Nestle is one of the biggest like, cow companies in the world. They're a dairy company. It's the core of their business. And almost, almost all of the watersheds in the U.S. and really in the world have cows in them, and cows make water dirty. And Nestle's looking for some water that hasn't been polluted by their cows. And this is one of the last places that it exists. So that's why they're going after this. They were, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the history of Nestle because they're an interesting company. They were founded in 1866 um, by the inventor of artificial breast milk or infant formula. Um, he invented this product to replace something that people get for free. And uh, that's been Nestle's business ever since is to sell people things that they could get for free. Um, they're also big in the chocolate business and uh, basically all kinds of dairy. Now they've become a, an international conglomerate. They're, they're based in Switzerland and um, they're the biggest food and beverage company in the world. They own all kinds of brands that you've heard of are actually owned by Nestle, of any, anything that's food and beverage. Um, ice cream. So the, the core of their business is still dairy and dairy is one of the most polluting industries in the world. So it's ironic that they'd be in the bottled water business as well, but that's how conglomerates work. The fact is, uh, ownership of water doesn't always go with ownership of the land where the water is. For example, I have a, a friend who has a spring on his, uh, a spring comes up on his farm, but he doesn't own that water because somebody lives next door and, and is downstream and it depends on that river to be flowing. So water rights are kind of a, a strange, counterintuitive uh, version of property rights. Um, the fact is we, the public, own, own this water right now. And I don't see why we should be selling it unless it's, there's a public benefit. You're saying it seems a little odd to use a fish hatchery to defend uh, uh, environmental justice. I agree with that. I don't think the fish hatchery is the best use of this water either. But the fact is it's publicly owned water and the fish hatchery is a public, ag is a public agency that is under, it's under the influence of the democratic process and Nestle is not. And uh, if we decide we don't like fish hatcheries, we can do something about it. We can, you know, Oregonians could eliminate fish hatcheries if that's what we decided was our public priority. And we own this water and it's up to us to decide what our priority is for it. And, well, I don't think the fish hatchery is the best, but apparently the majority of Oregonians do like fish hatcheries. She's asking what we can do about this. And the best thing that we know how to do about it, I guess we're pressuring right now, is to write letters to the governor. He's already gotten 20,000 and I don't know how many it's gonna take. Um, we're also writing representatives, right? Your representatives now we're writing, our now we're writing our, our state legislators. Not that they have any authority over it, but since Kids Harbor's not responding to public pressure, we're saying it's writing our legislature to tell them to pressure Kids Harbor. Um, it's really in his hands, and he seems to enjoy a reputation as being salmon friendly, so this is his opportunity to put his money where his mouth is. Sound.
right, I think we're ready to get started. Thanks, everyone, uh, for coming out to our press conference today. Uh, I'm Julia DeGraw, the Northwest Organizer with Food and Water Watch. And uh, we're going to have uh, Jeff uh, Klatke open up the uh, press conference. Uh, he's speaking on behalf of AFSME. He's their treasurer. And uh, then I will speak a little bit more about uh, the actual protest that uh, Food and Water Watch and Bark are filing uh, against a water bottling uh, proposal for Nestle. And then Barbara Willer will speak, uh, who was a former Multnomah County Commissioner uh, after I speak. If you could all save your questions for after we've all spoken, that would be great. Thanks. Hi, good morning. My name is Jeff Clackey, and I am the treasurer of Oregon AFSME. Welcome to the Portland office of Oregon AFSME. For those who are not familiar with AFSME, we are the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, representing 25,000 public service workers delivering vital services ranging from public safety and corrections to early childhood and special needs education, from environmental protection to care for disabled adults in both the public sector and private sector. As public servants, we understand the importance of protecting what belongs to all of us including our shared resources, like our state's water supply. I co-authored a resolution that was presented to and approved by the Oregon AFSCME Executive Board in July of 2011, which opposed Nestle's attempt to purchase and control the municipal water supply of Cascade Locks. The resolution was approved to be forwarded to the Oregon AFL-CIO Convention in September of 2011. This resolution refers to a prior resolution passed at the 2009 Oregon AFL-CIO Convention that resolved to, quote, discourage any attempts at water privatization throughout Oregon. It also refers to ORS 537.110 titled Public Ownership of Waters, which declares that all water within the state from all sources of water supply belongs to the public. AFSCME has two main concerns about Nestle's proposal. Our first main concern is the privatization and commoditization of a public municipal water source. We believe this is illegal. We also believe it is immoral and short-sighted. Our second main concern is about Nestle as an employer, as well as their portrayal of themselves as being a job creator for the local community. In a study, study published in 1993, Nestle's previous project proposals to the communities in which it sought to build bottling plants are compared with actual results, which reveal that, at an average, only 24 permanent jobs were created per plant, and of those, only between 10 and 40 percent of local residents actually filled those jobs. Most jobs are typically filled by existing Nestle employees who are transferred. The net job creation for the residents of Cascade Locks extrapolating from Nestle's history would only be between two and ten permanent jobs. Furthermore, these jobs have not been at wages that could be considered competitive. Nestle has historically opposed their United States employees' right to form a union and bargain collectively for better compensation. I have learned recently that Nestle is close to entering into a project labor agreement with the Building Trades Council, which would ensure union jobs during the construction phase. I'm speaking for myself, not at an AFSCME position for this statement here. I personally feel that this was little more than a savvy move by Nestle to divide the labor community over this project and pit union against union. AFSCME continues to oppose the privatization and commoditization of a public water resource and continues to oppose a historically bad employer who has routinely overpromised and underdelivered family wage jobs in the communities in which it builds water bottling plants. For these reasons, AFSCME chose to join the Keep Nestle Out of the Gorge campaign. So today, um, as uh, the organizer for the Northwest organizer for Food and Water Watch, I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Um, uh, about what the coalition is working on right now, the next major step in the campaign, and some recent developments. Um, as I mentioned, I'm with Food and Water Watch. We're a consumer advo advocacy group working to ensure the food, water, and fish we consume is safe, accessible, and sustainable. In essence, we're protecting our most essential resources uh, for all people. 
So uh, Food and Water Watch and BARC have, have chosen to appeal two water resources decisions uh, on behalf of the entire coalition Food and Water Up to keep Nestle out of the gorge. The Keep Nestle Out of the Gorge Coalition includes conservation, environmental, religious, and public health and consumer advocacy groups that have been fighting for over two years to protect Oregon's water in the Columbia Gorge from a Nestle water bottling plant. Today, today Food and Water Watch and BARC, members of the Keep Nestle Out of the Gorge Coalition, are filing an appeal to permit uh, that the Oregon Water Resources Department decided to approve. In order to understand this appeal, a bit of background is needed. Nestle intends to bottle spring water in the Columbia River Gorge town of Cascade Locks under its Arrowhead brand. It will also bottle the town's municipal water under its Pure Life brand. The spring water Nestle intends to bottle is used by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife for a fish hatchery, and the state agency cannot simply sell or give away this water, at least without some state permits. Uh, in order for Nestle to bottle that water, three permits are required to be approved by the Water Resources Department. The final of these three permits is an actual water exchange permit that would lead to the state agency giving away public water resources that are owned by each Oregonian so that Nestle can bottle it. That controversial water exchange cannot be processed and approved until two related permits have been fully processed. We are fighting those two related permits with the ultimate goal of making sure that the water that ODFW is using for its fish hatchery cannot be used by Nestle. Uh, and we are also very grateful to Craig Law Center for taking on our case and rising to the challenge of protecting Oregon's water for Oregonians. However, in this case, the ultimate solution to keeping Nessie out of the gorge lies with Governor Kitzhopper. To date, over 10,000 Oregonians have let the governor know that they want him to stop Nestle from bottling their water. We are calling on the governor to ask Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to pull out of the water exchange that would allow Nestle to bottle and profit off of Oregon's public water resources. Our state legislators have been hearing from their constituents on this issue as well. Senator Jackie Dingfelder has expressed concerns about the break in the public trust that Nestle's water bottling proposal would bring to the state and is concerned about the environmental damages it could cause. She is part of a growing concern coming from our state legislature. The longer the governor waits to take action, the more government resources that will be used in defending permits and processing permits that will ultimately lead to a Nestle water bottling facility. The coalition and thousands of Oregonians are calling on him to do the right thing now and to say no to Nestle. Good morning. I'm Barbara Willer. In 2010, I had the privilege of being an interim Multnomah County Commissioner. Uh, during that time period was when I learned about uh, the possibility of Nestle moving into the gorge with a bottling plant and I decided to meet with officials of Cascade Locks and we had a great meeting. I understood why they wanted to have a bottling plant. They were concerned about jobs. We all know that throughout Oregon um, we're suffering from a recession. People need jobs but I in the end agreed to disagree with them that this was not the answer for jobs in Oregon that extracting our resources for as Jeff said very few jobs even my concern is that we're facing a planetary crisis on many fronts with our environment but none hits home so personally as water we cannot live without fresh water it's a shared legacy public trust and a collective responsibility that we ensure water is available to all people Selling public water to private companies who then bottle it and resell it back to us is wrong and bad public policy. To allow, to allow Nestle or any other company to take water from one of the gorgeous watersheds where fish are currently using it and trucking it through the already sometimes smoggy gorge is not only unnecessary for our needs, but a violation of the belief that water is a human right. Bottled water is bad for the environment. It takes up to 2,000 times more energy to produce a gallon of bottled water than a gallon of tap water. Manufacturing America's water bottles consumes 17.6 million barrels of oil each year. About three gallons of water are used to produce one gallon of bottled water. And not only is it using up valuable resources to produce bottled water, but only 25% of the plastic that bottled water sits in is generally recycled. The rest end up, end up in landfills and oceans, causing harm to the ecosystem and wildlife. So not only are we selling a public resource water, we are causing more damage to our ecosystem and unnecessarily using other resources to create the bottled water. 
Bottled water creates health and safety issues. Chemical additives in plastic bottles often leach into bottled water. These additives have been linked to obesity, breast cancer, and early puberty. Bottled water is a waste of money. Bull, one, Bull Run provides us with pristine water. When you calculate the cost for a gallon of bottled water, it can cost more than we pay for a gallon of gas. Tap water costs less than one cent a gallon. Also, Oregon taxpayers would be footing the bill for road costs for the 200 trucks a day that will occur after the Nestle plant is built. Is this a good use of tax dollars to bottle our collective resource, water, resell it to us, and in the process, increase costs to our transportation system and ultimately to us? I don't think so. In 2010, Multnomah County government banned the use of tax dollars for purchasing bottled water except in emergencies. This saved approximately 20,000 a year that could be used for more important services. In 2010, I worked with Food and Water Watch to help Multnomah County government ad adopt a Take Back the Tap program to encourage Multnomah County employees and Multnomah County citizens to not buy bottled water. The City of Vancouver and Clark County have also adopted similar me measures. By bottling Oregon's water, the state is breaching the public trust do doctrine. This would be the first time that a state agency relinquishes its control of water in order for it to be sold to Nestle for a profit. It is a breach of the public's trust to give our public drinking water away because it is basically a privatization of a public natural resource, one that humans and other species need to survive. It sets a horrible precedent that our resources are up for sale. It's important that the people of Oregon understand what is at stake here. We need to stand firmly and say no to allowing Nestle or any other private company to bottle our public water. It is un environmentally unsound and contrary to the direction we need to be moving as our environmental crisis deepens. The evidence is unmistakable. We are facing unprecedented environmental and human challenges due to climate change. Our local and state governments are working with its partners in our community to plan and respond to what's ahead. Selling public water resources is contrary to all the other work we are doing to repair our communities for these climate changes. Outside your home, and you wonder why your destiny has left you all alone. You dignify your suffering, but deep inside you know you don't have to live this way. You come off tough and callous. Like you don't give a damn Like you got some kind of blueprint For your castles in the sand But everything you try to build Keeps slipping through your hand You don't have to live this way You don't have to live this way You don't have to hang on to all you've been through You don't have to lay down And die like you do If you want to move on You can't hide You might have to go way down And find it inside You don't have to live this way You don't have to live this way
high You might have to go way down And find it inside Now you wake up with a longing Feeling like you care That maybe just today Life's a still unanswered prayer When you think back to your childhood dreams Well child, you're almost there You don't have to live this way 